Your work focuses on grit. So what is grit? Grit is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. Unpacking that a bit, it's the disposition to work on things for a very long time. For children, that could be months or years. For adults, we're talking about years and decades. Really in a consistent direction and, uh, and with great effort. And uh, the distinction I'd like to make is, is between grit and a closely related trait, one that's actually studied more both in economics and psychology, and that is self-control. So whereas grit is stamina for the very long term, self-control is the ability in the moment uh, when there are distractions or temptations nearby, you know, the ability to resist to those. So grit has this long-term feature and self-control has a more short-term time horizon. Some recent work suggests that intelligence is not a fixed capacity, but rather can change over time with effort. Is grit like intelligence in this respect? And how does grit interact with intelligence? I think one of the most important findings in social science in the past several decades is the discovery that traits like grit, like intelligence, both represent some amount of stability in the way we are, in the way we interact with the world, as well as change over time. In other words, you're unlikely to wake up next to your boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, and discover an entirely different human being. Um, on the other hand, as we all know from, from the people that we know and love, that, that they do change. Um, now, this change may be less predictable than we'd like. Um, it's not necessarily under our control, but people do change over time. They change in grit over time, and they change in every other personality trait that's been discovered or studied over time. Uh, and it looks like uh, intelligence too changes, although with intelligence, there's some evidence to suggest that these changes are less dramatic over time than with personality traits. Um, you know, the bottom line here is I think the emphasis is on change and not on completely static and fixed traits. Now, in terms of the interaction between grit and intelligence, uh, one question might be, well, if you are a high IQ individual, you know, does grit matter more uh, versus if you are a lower IQ individual? And we really don't have data suggesting that that's the case, uh, in part because to study that question, you really need a really broad range of individuals who uh, represent sort of the entire spectrum of intelligence and the entire spectrum of grit. And our samples tend to be very focused, for example, We've studied grit at West Point Military Academy, grit at the National Spelling Bee, uh, grit at elite universities, and um, these samples don't tend to allow enough range to really thoroughly study interactions. My guess is that rather than thinking about uh, grit and intelligence interacting in the way that um, it's sometimes thought, well, if you have high IQ, you know, does grit matter more or less, it's to actually really think about effort and the rate at which you can proceed in something. So effort being um, very influenced by grit and the rate at which you improve in things being very influenced by IQ as kind of like rate times time as we all learned in high school physics. So, it's important to actually do something for a long time with great effort. That's time. But it also matters how fast you learn or improve, and that would be rate or intelligence. So I think actually in my own mind, there's a multiplicative model where the very highest achievers tend to be high both in the time amount, uh, the, the, the amount of time that they spend on their pursued goals and the rate at which they achieve uh, skill increments or improvements. So it's really rate times time or uh, grit times intelligence. Do you think grit is a teachable skill? And what challenges do you see in teaching grit compared to other skills? I think grit is a teachable skill, which is different from saying I know that grit is a teachable skill. I think grit is a teachable skill for the following reasons. One is that um, there is this kind of change over time in grit that I mentioned is also true of other personality traits. That change comes in two forms. One is rank order change. In other words, if you take a classroom of 30 kids and you score them you measure grit and you just order them from highest to lowest grit. 
The question is, well, if you come back to that same classroom of kids five years later or even 10 years later, will it be the same rank ordering? And we know from our own research as well as personality research generally that it will not be the same exact ordering. There will be rank order change that the kid who was maybe in the middle of the pack on grit may have moved up or down, for example, in this rank ordering. There's a second kind of change that grit also seems to exhibit, and that's mean level change, which is the idea that, for example, if you took that same classroom of kids, well, they might uh, change in the rank ordering of their heights, but also if you come back five years later, they're all going to be taller. And in fact, we actually see that kind of phenomenon with grit. So when we take cross-sectional samples of adults who range in age from 20 to 80, we find that the older adults tend to be grittier, at least in terms of their self-reported questionnaire scores. And that suggests that um, it's possible that there's a maturation effect, that actually grit does grow over uh, the lifespan for probably environmental or experiential reasons. Um, given that data, we can't really uh, distinguish that possibility from the idea that, well, if you grew up in the 50s, you know, you're grittier than kids who grew up, you know, just, uh, you know, more recently in a different culture. So, so I think that there's some circumstantial evidence that you can teach grit, and we're working on it. So um, if you come back to me in a couple of years and our random assignment, placebo-controlled studies, in which you try to teach kids the kind of mindsets, the beliefs, and the skills that we think underpin a personality characteristic like grit, and we're able to see change that endures over time, that lasts beyond the completion of the intervention, and also that generalizes so that we see kids applying these skills and this mindset to diverse things that they do, not just one thing, but many things, then I will say that I know we can teach grit. The U.S. Department of Education has drawn on your work as it considers ways to improve student performance. Do you believe grit is something that can be taught in the classroom? And if so, how do you see it changing our education system? I think it's been interesting uh, for me as a researcher who was studying grit and also self-control, uh, you know, 11 years ago, right, in my first years at graduate school, and kind of, you know, like most academics, laboring away in an obscure, you know, office somewhere, nobody paying attention to them, to kind of see the flurry of interest in uh, constructs like grit, but also, you know, uh, self-control, as I mentioned, growth mindset, optimism, you know, broadly, as the economists like to call them, the non-cognitive skills or the non-cognitive dimensions of human capital. Um, and I've um, pondered, you know, what the interest is from the uh, perspective of policymakers and also educational practitioners and parents. Um, you know, why now? Why this renewed interest? Um, and I, I think that actually there's a reaction against the kind of very strong uh, standardized testing culture that emerged in the United States at the, uh, the last decades of the 20th century and this increasing focus on the big test, the SAT, um, the standardized achievement test uh, that kids would be scored on and that would go into what no child left behind um, uh, would consider, you know, the metric of academic success for kids. And the kind of um, a single-minded focus on standardized IQ or achievement test scores, I think, led to a pendulum swing back um, and to the sort of um, broader consideration of things like grit and self-control that intuitively, I think, um, parents, teachers, and even policymakers would maybe um, imagine would be important also for life. So that's, I think, what's going on in terms of the contemporary context, in terms of why you know there is this interest. You know, can teachers teach grit in school? Ought they teach grit in school? Um, I think most teachers believe that, in part, that is what they're doing, that character, um, not just grit, but, you know, uh, the other things I mentioned, and, and there are more, right, honesty, kindness, gratitude, and so forth, that, that that's part of their jobs as educators. Um, so I, I, do, I think that most teachers believe that in some way, shape, or form, they are modeling or teaching grit to their students um, in some ways. Um, I think what I'd like to know, for sure, is whether we can... Um, um, can we know that that's true? Um, beyond intuition, can we measure changes in performance, changes in persistence, um, and attribute that to a particular thing that we did as opposed to a whole package of things? And that's, I think, the challenge for education. Are we there yet? Absolutely not. Um, but we're working on it. And um, the educators that I work with are um, really committed to this for the long term. So they recognize that we might not be making progress in a year, uh, maybe not in two years, uh, but that if we really work on it with feedback um, and discipline that, that we will get somewhere.
HCEO's mission is to carry out comprehensive and interdisciplinary research into human capital development. How is your work influenced by this, and how does it influence interdisciplinary work on human capital and economic opportunity? I think the, the HCO mission and the structure, which is um, by design interdisciplinary, by design bringing together people who wouldn't have, uh, have conversations if they didn't have this kind of structure to bring them together, um, is brilliant because the questions of human behavior, uh, you know, broadly speaking, you know, how do we um, understand lives that are flourishing and understand how flourishing lives uh, dis are distinguished, you know, what led the, these human beings to have lives that are um, you know, complete with physical health, uh, economic well-being, psychological well-being, academic achievement. You know, what leads people down those trajectories versus uh, trajectories that have you know, uh, deficits in all of those outcomes? Um, that's a question that economists have been studying, but quite separately, I think, from uh, the way psychologists have approached those questions. And then, of course, we have our sociologist friends and the neuroscientists and um, anthropologists, and I think the idea that you could convene um, social scientists across the disciplines to focus on common problems is the, is the promise of HCEO. Um, it's not easy work, so I will say this, that um, oftentimes the uh, idea would be, well, you just get a bunch of people who study the same thing from different perspectives, they come into a room, and they automatically you know, cross-fertilize. Um, and I, I think that's not true. Um, so it's very hard, actually, I think, to communicate to somebody who's been trained in a completely different vocabulary with completely different assumptions. Their perspectives are so different. So that's actually the hard work of HCEO, is to not just um, uh, bring two people together for momentary interactions, but to make sure that these people sustain that conversation, um, because it will take a while, I think, for the um, collaborations to meaningfully develop. Mm -hmm.